And we're just so thrilled to have all of you here. I know many of you traveled to very far away. So that's how I kind of knew from like the Pacific Skyrock. Um, the Center for Environment and Sustainability at Western hosts this conference every year. Not the Sage Grouse Summit. This is the fourth Sage Grouse Summit. It's occurred in other locations. But this is also the 21st Spring Environmental Symposium. And so last year, for example, the topic was Farm to Table. Five years ago, it was an environmental film festival. So it's been a great honor to host everyone at the Sage Grouse Summit. The Center for Environment and Sustainability also includes two other major conferences per year. Every fall, we host the Headwaters Conference. Now in its 27th year, every summer, we host the Colorado Water Workshop. Now in its 42nd year. And so running these three conferences, as well as running the master's program and the undergrad environment and sustainability program, all of those things are underneath our Center for Environment and Sustainability. And one of the things we're very proud of is community outreach. The main mission of the center, the main mission question of the center, is how can academic understanding serve community environmental problem solving? And how can community-based environmental problem solving become the new classrooms for environmental education in an academic setting? Some of the ways in which we try to link those worlds between academics and community is through projects. Right now we have 35 master's students finishing their master's projects. It's a 600 hour commitment. And so you can think about that over 20 years, that's going to be 700, 600 hour master's projects that come out of this program to serve community needs. So if you're here from an NGO or a public lands organization or as a landowner, please reach out to myself or Corey Knapp to start a conversation about how those master students might be able to serve you. So we're really proud to have you here this year. I was thinking about how to kind of frame tonight um, for some of our students who are here tonight in the, in the front rows. And I thought immediately of a speaker who we had here about a year and a half ago, the, the environmental poet, the great environmental poet, Gary Snyder. And when Gary was here, I had to ask him a question, because Gary's not only an environmental poet deeply concerned about global climate change, he's also a famous practicing Buddhist who pushes the concept of accepting impermanence. So I had to ask him, Gary, how do you, as someone who's so concerned about climate change, but also promoting the acceptance of, of impermanence, how do you merge accepting impermanence with fighting climate change? And like a great Buddhist master, he just cut through the question, he said, all you can do is care for your place. All you can do is care for your place. And I think that that sagacious line from Gary is really fitting for tonight. Because when you think about the issue of species extinction, it can get as big as the question I asked Gary. Right? You think about some of the studies that show that we're in the sixth great extinction. The first five extinctions have come from things like asteroids hitting the Earth, volcanic events, and now the sixth great extinction is coming from this species with this vulnerable species covered in like skin that leaves easily with opposable thumbs and consciousness. Right? It's unbelievable that we've had that level of impact. Yet still, we represent about a thousand times more extinction than the natural background rate. E.O. Wil e. Wilson estimates that by mid-century we don't address climate change immediately, we're looking at maybe 25% of the world's species. And so how do you even begin to think about something that big? Well, I think that this conference very much is in the spirit of Gary's comment, of Gary Snyder's comment, all you can do is care for your place. Because when it comes to this place, we have before us a microcosm of all of those global issues in the sage grouse. And I think at this conference, we're hearing voices ranging from ranchers to biologists, to environmental activists, who help us think about that perhaps collaboration is our best way of caring for a place. And through caring for this place through the sage grouse, maybe we can even begin to think about such a major issue as the sixth great extinction. So it's a great honor to have all of you here tonight, and welcome. And I, and I hope to learn much from you, but this is not my field, so I'm all ears on this evening for Robin Reed's talk. Um, I want to briefly, before having Corey Knapp introduce Robert, I want to give a huge round of applause to four individuals, Pat McGee, Jonathan Cook, Corey Knapp, and Mandy Castile Danny. Without them, this conference would have been impossible. So let's...
We are extremely lucky to have Corey Knapp in our program as the coordinator of the Master of Environmental Management program focusing on integrative land management. She gave a brilliant talk this morning on her research focused on social vulnerability and attitudes towards sage grouse in this valley. Just welcome Corey Knapp to introduce Robin Reed. tonight and I just want to do a round of applause for the chef and all the people that made that food happen. <laughs> and a quick reminder before I do my introductions that um, if you are presenting early tomorrow morning in the first session, make sure to get here just a little bit ahead of time so that we can load your presentation on a computer. There will be one on the front desk out here so that we can load it up. Um, and you can also do that tonight if you have your presentation ready to go, we can, we can load it up. So with that, um, I am really pleased and excited to introduce both Robin Reed and Rox Hicks, who are both our keynote speakers for tonight. Um, we're really lucky to have these people here. And um, first off, I'm just going to... I'm going to introduce Robin Reed now, and I'll introduce Rox Hicks later as the second part of the keynote. Um, but Robin Reeves had this incredible career where she worked as a researcher with the International Livestock Research Institute in, in Nairobi for years. She's done collaborative conservation all over the world, in Asia and Africa, um, in Latin America, and in the Western United States. She also directs the Center for Collaborative Conservation at Colorado State University, um, a really amazing organization that's doing great things as well as being faculty in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability. Um, she has numerous publications, an excellent book that she's written recently, and we are just happy to host her tonight. So with that, um, Robin Reed. Help us not fight, we're still talking about a lot. 
And I think one of the hardest things to do in collaboration is what this conference is about, endangered species conservation. So I just want to want to really point out not only the Western State Colorado University folks, but also the Gunnison Sage Grout Strategic Committee and working groups in this area. It's really impressive what you do. We look all over the world. Mike isn't working. Mike's not working. So you've persisted for many years working together, and I just want to congratulate you. And, and we're watching you very closely from my center because we think your, your work is so special. So why should we bother? We're going to talk about why should we bother doing collaborative conservation? You know, what is it? You know, what is collaborative conservation? And then who does it? Who are these coalitions of unlike who come together? And then I'll give you an example from Africa, one from Colorado, and then finally I'll end up with sort of how do we build this better sort of common future for everyone? So why bother? This is one of my favorite, favorite quotes. It's from Paul Hawkins in a book that he published in 2007. And let me read it to you. And, and, and this unnamed movement, I think, is called the conservation. When asked if I'm pessimistic or optimistic about the future, my answer is always the same. If you look at the science that describes what is happening on Earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't have the data. Yet if you meet the people in this unnamed movement and aren't optimistic, you don't have a heart. And there's a lot of truth to that. So, and this is from Carol Acarius, who runs a watershed coalition on the front range in the upper South Platte. And, and her insight is that most marine ecological problems at this point in history require collaboration because they're so complex. And I think that's also, also true. So that gives us sort of a why bother, as we need to, and also because it gives, us, and frankly, it gives us hope. Okay, what is this beast? All right, so this is uh, Sue Roll, who works, worked in Navigate Partners in Oregon. She was talking about collaboration and, and, and she working for the BLM. And she, you know, she just said, this is hard stuff. This is a, we don't know what we're doing. And so it's kind of a dance that we're doing that we don't know the steps to. And I have to say, after being part of this for a very long time, I'm often just kind of terrified when I get in a collaborative group. I have no idea what's going to actually happen. But it's also exhilarating because great things can come out. So, and then what's conservation? Well, I really, love Aldo Leopold's definition. So this first one, the act and the art of living on the land without spoiling it. So you here in Gunnison with the sacred act, you are artists in what you're doing. And then conservation that works is conservation that works well for both people in the land. Actions that benefit one at the expense of the other are not conservation, they are something else. Not everybody agrees with this, with this um, definition of conservation, but it's very appropriate for collaborative conservation. So if you put those two words together, it sort of benefits both people and the land, as Aldo talked about. It tends to cross boundaries between public and private land, from state to federal to county to city land. Um, and so it's something that, that takes a lot of conversation to pull off. Um, usually it's due more people or organizations that are working together. Um, and they're looking for, they're trying to look from very, very different viewpoints um, and, and try to find solutions together. And really that last line, go beyond their own limited vision of what is what is possible. In other words, go to that sort of third space where they can innovate together. All right, so Rox is going to tell you how to do it. She's going to give great examples of how to do it, but let me just give you one slide of that sort of how to do it. So it's often, and this is one of the harder parts, and I think here in Gunnison, uh, we've found this out, it's really hard to be fully inclusive. And you have to be kind of a dog after a bone to be inclusive in these groups. Because there's always someone you're leaving out that can't come to the meeting or you know, is, is part of a, a group that you want to talk to. So you really have to work hard on that. And then you have to meet face to face. And that's how you know, our democracy really works well in places that are convenient for everybody. Um, you have to have leaders that you know, maybe charge ahead sometimes, but are often leading from the side or even leading from behind. So they're collaborative leaders. You know, and everybody in the group is responsible to make sure the collaboration happens. And, but you also have to be very aware in a group 
that you know these are the kinds of decisions we can make, and these are the kind of decisions we cannot make because there's different you know different compositions of the group. They can make some decisions and not others, or else the group will get frustrated. Um, you, you have to work constructively through disputes, and that's really hard. And, and you all, you all know with the Ghana and the Sage Trial, so that's absolutely part of the game. And then, and then, really, one of the things that really sets groups really going well is when they learn together and they and they and, and they discover together. This conference is just about that, and so that's that's very cool. And then, sort of maybe not focusing so much on this big success, but making small steps that kind of take you in the direction of. of of success, and then just learning and evaluating, adapting and learning and evaluating, adapting and going in that circle. Okay, so who is creating these coalitions of the unlike? Well, here's a, a set of pictures of different um, coalitions around the world here in Colorado, in South Dakota, Mongolia, um, in Wyoming, in Latin America, in Kenya, and so they're, they're happening everywhere. And I'm going to prove that and make that point. So this number is the number of watershed coalitions in the state of Colorado. So watershed coalition is a group that works in a watershed and, and does conservation and works on livelihoods in that watershed. Sometimes it's about water, sometimes it's about forest, sometimes it's about pasture <coughs> together. And this is the number of, if you take those 79 and you add in all the rancher collaboratives in Colorado and all the forest collaboratives and all the river collaboratives, then you get to about 141. At least that's what we're doing now, is looking and finding 141. But we think there might be 200. Just here in this one state, we might have 200 collaboratives. I found that kind of extraordinary. It's kind of very cool. And we're not alone. In Oregon, they might even have 300. And so who knows what they have in Utah? I mean, it's just it's quite extraordinary. In the country of Kenya and East Africa, they have 178 rancher-led coalitions that are conserving wildlife and also keeping the land open for livestock raising. That's a lot. 2,000 Mongolia community-based um, herder groups that are conserving their pastures and also um, you know, providing more milk and, and meat on the table for their families. That's a number. So around the world, I don't know, 30,000, 50,000, 100,000? There's a lot of these. And it's sort of, when we started adding this up, we are like, wow. This is the unnamed movement that, that Paul Hawkins was talking about. And it's sort of this one plus one equals three. It's, sort of, it, it's definitely this unnamed movement and more than the sum of its parts. Okay, so let me give you a, um, a couple quickly, a couple of examples from Africa and also from Colorado. So I'm gonna talk about this region, uh, maybe I'll use the pointer, this region in the box. And it's, it's uh, the area where the Maasai people live on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. <coughs> This is a dry sort of savanna landscape, classic, you know, umbrella trees and things like that. And so this is part of what's going on in this landscape. There's a lot of developing going on because populations are, are still growing in this region of, of people and, and they're developing and they're having great successful development, but that means that, that obviously means um, you know, lots of changes in land. And so, you know, here are some wildebeest and some, and some cattle. And, and the Maasai want to keep this open land open so that both the wildlife and the livestock can, can continue to graze. But you know the country is, is developing lots of roads, and so they need a cement factory, and so they put that in the middle of the, the, this corridor. This is another picture of the same landscape. Of, that's a flower farm in the distance, and it's um, they, they send flowers to Europe every night on, on KLM flights to the Netherlands. And so you know it's a very big business, and so that's not going away. And then these are some local, some of the local Maasai that are saying, well, let's plant a little bit of corn, so we have some corn along with our milk, you know, to keep our families going. And so the, the landscape is getting really crowded. So we worked together to try to um, to keep the land open, that sort of center thing. And, and what it really took was really getting the public policymakers to stop trying to take all the land. And this actually happens in India a lot. Um, a group of scientists that sort of wanted help but didn't really know how. And then a group of Maasai that said, please. Come and help us. We really, really need to figure out how to manage this land um, in a way that, that we can keep it in our own hands. So one of the first things that, that we started to do, to do together was to, to actually go out and to, and to figure out what the land looked like. They wanted to have a picture of their land. So what this is is on top of a topographic map. At the top is, is Nairobi National Park. And then all the pink things, all of those, are all the places where there are fences on this land. So those, it's about maybe about uh, 20 miles from the bottom to the top, 
And the wildebeest migration goes from that park up there and then goes down here in calves. So this is a very important migration zone. And then also people move their livestock through that landscape. So the land is, is used communally by, by livestock keepers. And so, you know, maybe map. Well, that, that looks, you know, that's interesting, but maybe not terribly effective. But then the folks said, we want to actually um, raise the resources so that we can pay people not to build fences and also to look for poacher snares because poaching is a big issue in the landscape. And so those, those blue areas is where people will be paid to keep their fences down. And one of the unexpected things that happened is um, over in Upper Wright is that for some of those smaller, um, those smaller pieces of land, um, people are making about, they were doubling their income um, in the dry season when they really, really needed income from this biodiversity payment, which was unexpected. And then really unexpected is that families were, were using the payment to send girls to school. And so it was really, it kind of had some development aspects that we didn't expect, but that were really delightful. Um, and then what happened next? Well, first, uh, the, the city council of Nairobi wanted to actually take over the entire area and just grab it by eminent domain. And so the Maasai started to protest and they won. And then they, you know, they, both of those things. And then the map was the basis for a, the very first land use plan in Kenya in the Savannah. Um, our students that worked on this, and these are two of our students, um, became the governor and also the architect of those 178 conservancies I talked about previously. And then the governor, once he got on seat um, about three years ago, he started implementing the land use plan um, and, and making it happen to keep the land open. And it's really big, made big waves in Kenya. People are like, wow, we really can do this. Okay. And so this is what sort of what they say about. It. So the governor says it's about giving space, giving a chance to both livestock and wildlife. And then this is actually from Tanzania, uh, Maasai Lake. We can now start to see wildlife as our cousins. We can start to drink their milk. Okay. So let's re return home to Colorado. Here we are in northern Colorado, north of Fort Collins. So Fort Collins is kind of down here a little bit. Um, this is a landscape that um, many of you might know Rick and Heather Knight who worked in this area for a long time, but also you may know some of the other players. But the, this, the, the, federal, the federal government, state agencies, the city, the county, the Nation Conservancy, a whole group of ranchers got together and over 20 years. They basically were trying to create a corridor all the way here from the, the Rocky Mountains down into the plains so that, that the animals that have moved across those landscapes could actually do that. And what they were worried about is here's where Collins is growing fast, and they basically, that was going to become all houses, pretty much on 40 acre parcels. And so over 20 years, um, you know, they kind of pulled off a major miracle. And so this sort of, this color is the Forest Service's state land. And then these are the, the, the ranching ranchers who decided they wanted to put easements on their lands, and that those are. Um, former ranches that were bought by the city and the county. And so this is sort of the, all the partners of this effort, and actually there's more than that. And they conserve um, 55,000 acres, and that's a lot in the Northern Front Range. Around here, that may not seem like a lot, but boy, it's a lot in that area. And, um, and, it, and, and it, uh, raised $26 million, and then also, super importantly, these ranch families, a ranch families donated almost $2 million worth uh, of value of land. Now they got a, a lot out of the tax credit, as you all know, um, from doing that as well. It wasn't like it was all donations, but it was a very, very important part of that. So, and this is sort of um, what's happening now in this region. So they're kind of moving on to another thing. Um, so it's sort of traditionally, like many places where people ranch, you know, people were ranching. And why, why wouldn't you ranch? Um, and so their management focus was livestock raising. But now what we're, what we're, we're doing together is trying to bring new income streams to ranchers that have to do with preserved wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, clean water, and, and renewable energy. And that's something that, that we've recently got some, some good resources to get that going, and so we've established something called the Colorado Conservation Exchange, which is this big funding uh, investment fund that will, will, will work to pull this together. Okay. So let me sort of end with sort of talking about and it's sort of doing me kind of going out on a limb, um, sort of things that, that, that I can see that we can do to build a better common future. So this little ferry that's up there, 
kind of my imaginary fairy, I often think that we're sort of, when we're starting a relationship, whether it's be a personal relationship or a team together, we're often on this knife edge. And we can either fall over here, uh, off this knife edge as we, as we have relationships with, with each other, go into the land of competition. Or we can fall over into the land of co cooperation. And I want to encourage us to consider to fall over in that direction. Competition is good, but to make sure that we include uh, cooperation as a major way that we work together. And also, I just, these kind of maps, they drive me crazy. <laughs> they drive me absolutely crazy. So here's the, I don't know, probably 2012 election map or something for the president. And I just think, I think we're really missing the boat when we think of our country this way. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. This is our country. This is the county level, and it's mixed. I mean, okay, maybe there's some pure blue on there somewhere, and there's some pure red, but a lot of it is really mixed. And this is where we are right now in Gunnison County. It's purple as heck, you know? So let's, let's let, think of ourselves this way, is in, in this boat together, rather than going, rowing different boats. Because I think that place, when we're together in that boat, is a lot more innovative than when we're separate. I think it is a ton more innovative. So I would just encourage us to do that. And then just sort of this idea, let's do that hard work of face-to-face -face democracy. It's a big deal and it's really hard, but man, when it works, it's awesome. The first set of stakeholders at the local level, that's exactly what the Gunnison um, working groups are doing. You know, why face-to-face? -face? Because it's hard for us to really get mad at our neighbor who happen, happens to be in a different political party, who is our, also our dentist or our rancher that provides us food, let's say. So it's, you know, rather than what far away politicians live us up to think. And then why together? Well, the old African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And it's really true. Why diverse stakeholders? Because there's more innovation, more ideas, and then we want everybody to help. We can't, you know, we don't, we, we don't want to leave the folks out. The preserve here's Albert saying, the significant problems we face cannot be solved with the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So let's kind of take that at heart. Okay, so let me end with one last quote that I just love, sort of an interaction. So this is Lee Kronk, is um, an anthropologist from uh, Rutgers University, and he was in Southern Africa talking to Bushmen. <laughs> And so we had a friend named Moma, and Moma is a click-speaking Bushman. And they were talking about giving among the Bushmen. So, so, so Lee asks his friend, you know, what about giving? And, and Moma says, giving is when I take a thing of value and give it to you. Later, much later, when you find some good thing, you give it back to me. Then when I find something good, I give it to you, and so we will pass the years together. And he says, well, what would count as a fair exchange? For example, how many strings of bees would you give if your friend gave you a spear? And Homa says, anything is acceptable because we don't trade with things, we trade She's worked as a biologist in refuges and in the partners program, and she's really focused on coming up with innovative solutions with private landowners and um, public land managers um, for creating conservation partnerships. So with that, thank you so much, Rob, for being here. said, uh, why don't you do a talk with Robin Reed? I don't get presentations, I just do. And so I thought, okay, let's see, no dinner, then adult beverages, then a presentation, I can do this. We can do all kinds of things when people have a little alcohol in their systems. But the first thing I'm going to do is, and you've got 
see later at the end how I tie this in, but we're gonna watch a movie. And um, it's a good way to, you know, relax. That's have fun. <laughs> so what do I do? <laughs> <laughs>
service for 28 years and um, I've been with Refuges, Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program and I'm now with Ecological Services out of Cheyenne and I am a collaborative conservation biologist and there is no title of Fish and Wildlife Service that has that so they keep moving me around because they're not really sure what to do with me. So it's, uh, it's, it's neat because I've experienced a lot in my career and I have seen a lot but mainly I've seen where people really need to stay on the ground. And what I'm gonna show you is kind of a snapshot of some of the work that we did with the Partners Program up in Montana as we go along here. And some of my experiences, a couple stories that I've you know, experienced in my, my time uh, with the Partners Program. And you know now it's a whole new game. It's, it's a new area in Wyoming where I'm at now and new people. It's, Way fun. Collaboration is a lot, a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun because of what people are trying to achieve, like what's going on here with the Gunnison Sage Growth. So it's it's just wonderful to work to be in. Uh, a little bit of history. We, we're, you'll hear some of these terms and some of the things I'm going to talk about this evening. Uh, just briefly, which I thought was interesting when I was researching this, from 1969-1980 is when really the acts got implemented, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and Endangered Species Act, which I work with quite a bit. And what was interesting in what I read, they had the shared characteristics address different environmental or resource conservation, use enforcement actions and the motivation for change, and it was top-down prescriptions and a focus on process permitting, decision, procedures. Now, some of these acts have some very good things to go with them, but I thought it was interesting that they have characteristics that were similar. And this is from the Man from Snowy, uh, Man from Snowy River, and it's not me, but <laughs> no, typical of, of uh, top-down. So how do we balance rural communities, viable economies, and healthy landscapes? And I took out of some of this coming up is from Lynn Scarlett, who is with, uh, she's like direct, deputy director for Department of Interior. She said, is, is there a way to seek ways out of this process prescription and fines and away from the battlefields? And we're hearing a lot about battlefields right now. The interests of all converge in conservation and collaboration Conservation becomes the means by which local, regional, and national environmental groups, but I might also say diverse stakeholders, can engage in landscape conservation or restoration and achieve a balance between human actions and fish and wildlife means. And about uh, shortly after the recognition of some battlefields, we had Gail Norton that was head of the Department of Interior, and she came up with the four C's, which was um, collaborate, uh, conservation, and uh, see, now I have to look what the heck my four C's are. Uh, so it, it was uh, consultation, cooperation, uh, communication, and conservation, which is an excellent uh, kind of getting away from the battlefields, putting things together. How I kind of I kind of have my own, and that's conservation of critters in collaborative communities, so I changed it. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so within uh, that, those four C's, um, you really have to look at innovation, incentives, place-based information, and integrated decision-making to really make conservation work. Innovation, there are no cookie-cutter solutions. Every situation is different, everywhere I've been, there's different solutions, you really got to Think out of the Buddha box, think out of the wine box. And so they, they encourage and foster some innovative techniques for management and creative solutions that will help people and threaten endangered species. There are solutions, but it takes some work and you just can't always stay in the same box. Incentives, look at it, like what's a common goal? Look at the whole picture, We and it was talked about today quite a bit, Look at the whole picture for landscape conservation. And what I'm going to show you coming up here 
is the area where I worked in Montana, which is near the Canadian border. Let's see, I think it, it's clear. Yeah. So I was working. right in here and <clears throat> what we're working on is bull trout populations and we'll see some pictures on them. mainly fishery projects but in this area all in the crown of continent we have every, we had everything have everything lynx uh, grizzly bears bull trout uh, the list goes on and on populations were doing excellent still are doing excellent um, with the bull trout in particular the they were doing really well up in the tributaries. They're as salmonids, which some people don't know how they are, but as migratory fish, came down through a reservoir into and used all these tributaries um, and for their what's called knit reds, where they had their nesting areas. And that's where you know they populated, went back into the reservoir, went back up into Canada, so they go back and forth. So there was no border. There was no barrier. They, the fish know no Canadian line. So uh, we did work quite a bit with Canada too, which you'll see. Uh, that's a bull trout right there. And then we were all, which when I started was not on the threatened or endangered list. So you're kind of, I'm gonna kind of show you pre and post listing. Uh, and then we were also doing projects, on the ground projects for the West Slope Cutthroat Trout, which were listed as sensitive. Then when you go up into Canada, it's all different. It's a different language. I did learn A and the word process a lot. And they did touch me quite a bit up there. But up in Canada, the bull trout is a sensitive species. So it's all different. So up in Canada, um, some places in Montana, you could fish them, but it all depended on how it ended up under the listing. So when I started working with them, I went up to Eureka, Montana, knowing absolutely nothing. And I said, well, where should I work? Where should be my focus area? And NRCS guy says, Eureka, Montana, they have the best of the best. <clears throat> Gray Creek is the best of the best stream where we can do some restoration work. It has full trout, like you can't believe, because they come out of Canada, they did great, they cut the they, uh, kokanee salmon. So like, okay, that sounds good. Get up there, and I get to meet these wonderful gentlemen right here, the irrigation district. Characters, unbelievable characters. And so, let's see, I stepped right into pre-listing where they had, and I'll show you here in a minute, they had a diversion dam on Gray Creek, and they were gonna be required to screen it. And they're like, yeah, over my bed, da, da, da. and so, the fights began. I was in the middle of the battlefield when I got there, Klamath Basin all over again, like, holy cow, what do I do? Uh, and like these guys, I can, let me find it here. The one guy, I'm sitting here in this meeting, I gotta look this up, because I don't know the Bible very well. <clears throat> so this one guy, he go in the meeting, he goes, uh, pulls out Genesis 1, 26, he said, so God said, let us make human beings in our image, in, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may, so they may rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So in his mind, that was take. I can take fish. So then another guy pulls out a Bible wife. You can't take fish. So I'm like, holy cow, what did I get to it? It's a Bible. You know, we're so, I, you know, so off we went. What do we do? We were lucky enough to have a Forest Service master student do a watershed assessment in the entire watershed. And so he ranked all the projects that we could work on for restoration for bull trout. The stream in particular had a lot of what's called ripple, the you know, fast water no resting areas for bull trout. So we said, okay, we're going to restore some of these areas where we can have some resting areas for bull trout. But first thing we got to do is we got to look at the diversion for the Glen Lake Irrigation District. So this is what they had. This is the, 
Um, the bull trout would come upstream and have to get through a log dam in order to get to the upper headwaters for their nesting and mating. So then, but at the same time, the um, irrigation district, because of the community and their water, needed to take water down this canal. It provided water for 138 users in the valley, so they absolutely had to have it. Now they had senior water rights, so they had absolutely every, they had every intention and every <coughs> chance to take as much water as they want to. They could take enough water to dry up Grand Creek if they needed to because of their own water rights. And of course everybody was going nuts. But this diversion was also on Forest Service land. Forest Service, as it got closer to listing, and then listing they said, you need to screen the ditch. And so all the battles kept going. So what we did is we implemented a $500,000 screen project diversion where the fish could come up this way and then up this way. If they got trapped here, um, we could open this up here and let them out to go back downstream. Then the water could still go and provide water to the users in, in the Eureka area. Here it is right here. I mean, there was a road right here and the stream kept eroding into the road. So county commissioners, the town, they're all saying we're going to lose our road, what are we going to do? So again, put in the single channel, plantings, and now I guess it's working perfect. I haven't seen it for a while, but working great. And then I was bored, and I was bored, but I had to do more. So I was like, so supervisor, can I go up to Canada and work? And they're like, well, let's see, it's part of that watershed, and I don't see why not. So I'm like, sure. So I go up to Canada, and I work with these fellows here, and he was in the a farm program, which was similar to an NRCS program, and he needed, he had a creek that had bull trout in it also. So we wanted in water intake structure, got the water intake structure in the construction water. Worked with this guy here to duplicate the fencing project we did down in the landowners in Montana. Pretty happy people. Um, but then, let's see, we did projects up there for two years and then I was told I couldn't do work in Canada anymore. Cool, I got two in, that's, that's good. And so I think they thought that I was getting to be buddies with Border Patrol or something, because, and I kind of was, but, um, <laughs> back and forth, they go, awesome, oh, how are the grizzly bears doing? You know, show me your paperwork, here. fine. How are the bull trout doing, how are the grizzly bears doing? Okay, good, you can go. That's all I'd say. So the other thing that we worked on were some innovative habitat improvement projects for like grizzly bears. We were losing, uh, uh, Montana Fish, Life, and Parks were always having to put down some grizzly bears, getting into problem areas, particularly trash areas, um, dump areas. So we built some fencing. With, uh, uh, built this right there around the storage uh, or bins, trash bins. We had a workshop for the seven strand, eight strand uh, electric fencing to put around livestock, like when they went up for outfitters and, and calving areas, we used that quite a bit. Then helped out landowners that had particularly goats and chickens that were vulnerable to the grizzly bears. And you can't see this too well, but there's fencing right here with the goats and chickens and all that would be. So, keeps them in business but protects the you know the species. So it's a win-win deal. Another fellow that we work with, he wanted to thin trees, excellent at it. And but what he did it too is he kept buying more and more land and put easements on it. Then he'd go in and do the thinning and he'd build roads and, and he said, So rocks, how do I get vegetation in there quickly as soon as I put the road? I said, well we'll just get in there, see as quickly as we can. And it's like you build it, they will come. Sure enough, year next year, we had wolves show up. We had wolves show up and uh, grizzly bears, and they were all using those whole areas. It was pretty neat stuff. Okay, so um, heading, heading towards conclusion, successful conservation and collaboration. 
You're not alone once you start working with others, coming together over conservation and maintaining the economy. The cat is what I felt most of the time. But then as I got more into it, I think I got to be one of the German Shepherds because uh, once you get the trust, once you start working with col um, collaboration and the economies and, and the communities, they just really cherish that. You don't realize how much how the successes you can have in conservation of species when you're working together. Successful co collaboration, conservation, back to the movie. What's your one thing? Try and think about what are, again, some innovative uh, incentives, place-based information, integrated decision-making. How can you make some changes? Think, you know, thinking what is not normal? What's gonna work here? Bottom-up conservation really works. We have some really good programs with, with um, you know, ES that work great. When we heard about them, CCAAs, A's, um, Safe Harbor. It still works really well from the bottom up. Challenges, equal opportunities, building trust. And you'll hear from my husband tomorrow and Larry Hicks. People support what they help to create. Another quote, conservation that works in con is conservation that works not only for natural communities, but for human communities as well. Actions that benefit one at the expense of the other are not truly conservation. And Robin kind of said that, and she said it's Aldo Leopold, and I'm like, cattle tool, Aldo Leopold, what the heck? You know, that's <laughs> so I, I'll end with this from Chris Ledoux, and I just, this, I just love this. It always just sticks in my head. And it's the beginning of a song, and I think it's, the, um, this old hat and it says, well, there's always been groups of people that never could see eye to eye, but I always thought if they ever had a chance to sit down and talk face to face, they might realize they've got a lot in, in common. Thanks a lot. Yeah, because you have to go to the bar to get there, actually. <laughs> well, it would be great if folks have questions now. Um, I'll ask Rob and Ray to come back up and pass it over to them. Successes. 
Um, another thing that we've certainly found in Kenya, and I've seen many times, is start with the thing that's really easy, over on the easy side of collaboration. So don't start, if you can, don't start with endangered species conservation, start with weeds. You know, in other words, work your way up to the things that are really you know, controversial and hard, because in the process of working on the easier things, you develop trust, you develop relationships, you meet your dentist who's next door and your neighbor, and, and, and you understand each other and you develop that trust. So those would be, I mean, I, I could actually go on for five minutes about this, but I actually, rocks, I, 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 I'll bet she has something to say in response to this too. Oh, not really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more to it than that, and there's many people in this room that, 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 that know that. But, um, yeah, and I don't, I don't think there's one way to do this. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. It wasn't really my four eyes. I kind of swiped it from one scarlet, but um, but fits, you know, in everything we do. And, and there are barriers, and I ran into them a lot. And, and that's, you know, regulations, policies. Um, you can't do it like that. I'm like, really? I mean, because I'm not one, I wasn't one to um, take no for an answer. I'm kind of a badger. I hold on and don't let go. No, got quick. But you, you know, you try and find, try and maneuver. You know, I can't focus on this. But is there something else I can focus the, on that would help this? Is there something else I can do in the habitat that will help the bull trout or grizzly bears or whatever it may be? Um, may not help, you know, like the bull trout in directly, but in the long run, it may help in the big picture. And it may take years, and I guess patience and. and you know, that's one thing for the landowners that helps because we were lucky, they were patient. And we said, you know, this isn't gonna work because of this. But this might work, just hold on, you know, like funding or whatever it is. So, you know, that's why I say, I'm not really a single species biologist because, you know, there's just so many avenues you can go if you just keep an open mind and, and you can maybe jump over those hurdles or barriers. Does that help? Okay. Uh, my question is, if either of you have experience with these collaborative uh, work teams, that you do sit down together and work face to face, and so you are able to communicate at this level, but you may not have the, uh, you may not be pushing answers of course but with that irrigation district the toughest thing was um so they they had what the senior water rights but the state you know was pressuring them to keep a certain you know, cfs in the stream for the bull trout and I'm like uh you know that's not going to work with these guys and they get it they they know it's not they're not harming the fish they know they that they have to get their water, and they also are very conservative. They like the fish in there. And it was hard for me to say, you know, you guys, um, could you kick, you know, like so much CFS out in a drought year? And, you know, after a while, though, they, they would do it working with me, but they wouldn't for anybody else. 
but it still was difficult because I wanted to say, you know, God, there's water leasing, there's all these things you can do, and all that. And they said, no, we aren't going to do it. And I'm like, okay, what can we do without pressuring that side of my idea of what, or somebody else's idea? It's like, okay, what can we work with here? So I'd say, guys, you know, it's a dry year. We could just kick some water out and be like, yeah, we we're going to do that anyway. So does that help? That was one situation I had. I don't really have a situation for you, but um, one of the first things I think of is um, uh, getting a, somebody that's a mediator, a good negotiator, to take the team through kind of a, either a planning process or a thinking process where there's somebody from outside that's kind of pushing them so that it opens up the conversation a little bit more. You may not be able to open it up a ton, but you may be able to open it up a little bit more. So that'd be one thing that I would think of right away. The second thing I've seen work a ton is taking a group that's that's feeling pretty comfortable in their place to another place where they're having maybe a, a little different conversation. Maybe it's not more open, but it's just different. And they're tackling the issue that might be something that your group really might could be tackling in two or three years. And just getting out of, you know, getting out of places and having that conversation with peers in kind of that safe way where you kind of go, oh wow. And then coming back and having the conversation about, hey, can we try that? Can we try to move in that in that way? That would be another thing, you know, sort of Changing people's mindsets, uh, you know, according to that, and then you know, it'll change everybody's mindset, including yours. <laughs> so those two things would be what I try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked about all the collaborations going on across the world, and I, I feel like we have a lot of us up here yep. to the point where we see a lot of the same faces at these meetings, and to me, it's almost collaboration fatigue. <laughs> Going on, and at what point do they stop being even you know a thing that's useful, or you're getting even positive feedback? I mean, at what point do you say to me you need to collaborate? So I think there's I think there's a, a bunch of issues that you don't need to collaborate on. So be very careful about a joint you know starting a new collaboration, and, um, uh, meaning things like you give an example um, things that that are uh, you know, a single species issue that's in one place um, and doesn't cross boundaries. You don't have to collaborate about that. Um, or issues that are so terribly controversial that collaboration just won't work and it needs to go to litigation or mediation. So those are sort of two ways of a spectrum. Um, so, so being very careful about going to the process because yes, it's, it's absolutely exhausting and you can waste a lot of time. And if you get to the point of fatigue, then people aren't going to participate. Um, most collaboratives start because there's a very big event that occurs that, that just forces people to act. And so, for example, we're working on a collaboration that actually doesn't have an event that's triggering it, um, and it's, it's really hard to bring people together on something that isn't making them step out of their box because they're scared and they really you know, need to, to work together. Um, and so if you're in that situation, if there isn't an event that's causing something, you know, causing you to come together, then, then, then don't collaborate. Um, you know, it's, and it, it's kind of the kind of thing where um, you just have to be really careful. Despite what we've said, how wonderful collaboration is and, and all those sorts of things, you have to be really, really careful about engaging. So I, I think your point is really well taken and it takes, it takes really thinking about um, whether this is, we really need to do this in a collaborative way or we can just
And I think a lot of times they, they don't end up being involved and then, you know, the result is these big court battles that people not understand because that is. And I just wonder, you know, how you think about that when you're setting up a collaborative, you know, bringing in those outside groups that maybe aren't part of the local community, whether they can play a role. I was so hoping that, that rocks from a federal agency would, would help with the answer to this question, because this is a tough one. Um, you know, so, so if you take the, the Gunnison example, um, what they're doing so, so terribly successfully is that they're bringing together the federal folks, the state folks, the, the city folks, they're bringing together ranchers that are focused on the local level. So in other words, they're sort of spanning those levels, and um, because of that, and, and because I assume of a, you know higher levels in those agencies, they basically have developed sort of a power structure that people trust that they're going to look after, you know, look after the, the the national interests or the state interests or that sort of thing, because they've been very inclusive about who is part of that. So, you know, I kind of look to those examples, but you'll still you'll still have you know people from far away that can bring bring a case and litigation that, that will really, um, really challenge a, a local situation, a, a local group that is working you know, very much across those, those levels of, let's say, government and interests. And I guess, um, I guess I would say that if you create that powerful local group that includes all those interests, that isn't just locals, but also others that work for state and you know, national, things like that, then you, you, in a sense, you kind of buffer yourself against Someone coming from you know from a very different perspective, but also to listen to what they have to say, um, you know, depending on whether they're willing to talk about it. But um, I think I think that that really developing that strong, um, you know, sort of powerful local inclusive structure um, can help to mitigate that. But it, it, it still can be a problem. Yeah. Uh, so I find that collaboration is a really hard subject to breach. It's a new realm to kind of dive into. And what have you found is the best way to approach that conversation? Being an outsider, um, coming into a situation, what is the best way to kind of dive into that dialogue and sort of help address those issues? We've all been in classes on this, and we do a partnership piece with her on this, and uh, it is really difficult. But I mean, the biggest, and it comes up again and again, the biggest number one word is trust for everything. And if you don't have the trust of your landowners or other agencies or NGOs, you haven't know, built that repertoire. It's difficult. You know, it may take longer, but um, you, know, you just. I guess in my situation, I just dive in and I listen. I mean, what is it, and like I said up here, what does the community need? What is, what's their economy? What, I mean, like in partnerships, what doesn't happen is people don't really think, and, and I get, we, Rome and I talk about this, if put it on a business model. I mean, think about what are the gifts that people have that can bring to the table instead of the problem or where it's gonna hit. And, and like use their gifts. I mean, use the heck out of them because you can go a long ways. I mean, just like my the, the irrigation district, uh, we had a situation where we needed to go in and fix uh, some structures, and the state put a window of when we could go in and into the stream because of bull trout migration. And I'm looking, I'm like, how are we going to pull this one off? In the meantime, I, I'm applying for grants. I get the money. I said. Steve, who do you all can get in there? So I used him. He knew the contractors, he knew the people to get in there and get out before the deadline. So I mean, just again, think out of the box. Who can help me? And listen. So um, I have an undergraduate class and also a graduate class in collaborative conservation, and it's really hard when you're starting out, especially when you're young. Um, you know, sort of. So what you see in, in Gunnison is you see a cake that is fully baked, and it's a beautiful, it's not almost like a wedding cake, it's a very big thing, this collaboration. And that took years and years to bake that cake. 
And so if you're starting out from, you know, like zero, um, it seems to me that there's a couple things you can do. First, attach yourself to the big team and kind of be a real student of how they do what they do. Watch, you know, watch a Nate Seward and how he does what he does. Or watch a Jim Cochran and how he does what he does, and, and others. You know, and, 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 and really talk to them and ask them, so how did you get in this? How did you make the first steps? How can I make my first steps? That'll help you a ton. Now, if you're, if, if you're starting out, like what Roth was saying is, I've watched her. She doesn't go and, and bring 20 people together and start talking about a new issue. She goes one by one. She goes to one rancher and talks to them, and then goes to you know, somebody else from the state government, and then goes to And then just is a student of the issue from different perspectives. And then what she's searching for, she's searching for that sweet spot in the middle that might exist. It might not exist, but it might exist where lots, lots of disagreement, but there might be disagreement space that, that, that everyone might be able to talk about. And then she might bring those folks together. You know, in other words, you don't start out with a baked cake. Start with the ingredients of the cake and see if it works. And if you can't find that sweet spot, then you can't find the sweet spot. You know, so don't always assume that, you know, that this is the way, the way to go. I'm sure you, you've had that experience in working, working in, in many areas. But those would be the two things I would do. Go to the bake cake and then also start one by one and listen to time. And that's what I've seen rocks through over and over again in many other experiences.